Amen. We've been preaching through the book of Zechariah, the last book that we'll be looking at in the Minor Prophets. And it's easy found. It's between Haggai and Malachi. It's a second book back in your Old Testament, the book of Zechariah. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll be in the third chapter tonight. Possibly jump over, jump over into the fourth chapter tonight. And uh, how many are excited about what God is saying in His Word? Amen. And um, I mentioned last week that um, the first eight chapters are pretty much messianic, meaning that it's much about the first coming of Jesus Christ. And um, I thank God for the fact that he, he came, Jesus came, and he's coming again. Amen. Zechariah chapter 3, we're going to read the first three verses, and then we're going to make our journey through this chapter 3 and possibly chapter 4. And he showed to me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this the brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was, was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. I want to use for a subject tonight, meet Joshua. May be seated. Last week we talked about meet Zechariah. Tonight we're going to talk about meet Joshua. Zechariah introduces us to Joshua, the high priest, here in chapter 3. In chapter 4, we find that Zechariah introduces us to another individual by the name of Zerubbabel. And we're going to look at Joshua and Zerubbabel because if you don't understand Joshua and Zerubbabel, we're going to have a hard time wading through this book in the future. In fact, there's some incredible stuff that will hook into the book of Revelation with Joshua and Zerubbabel. Now, Joshua is not the sidekick of Moses. This is not the same Joshua that wrote the book of Joshua, took the children of Israel into the land of promise. This is not the same Joshua that worked with Moses in the fulfillment of the children of Israel coming through the wilderness and finally Moses taking, uh, Joshua taking them into the promised land. This is a Joshua that was born in captivity in Babylon. He was most likely a Levite. He is going to be a priest for the new temple that they're building that Cyrus the king gave the children of Israel permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so Joshua, this Joshua, is going to be the high priest for the temple that is to be built in Jerusalem when King Cyrus gave them permission, the king of the Medes and the Persians, back to go back to Jerusalem. We talked about that last week. Now Joshua is a type and a picture of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you study Joshua, the name means Jehovah delivers. In fact, you can trace the name Joshua and call it Yahshua. Yahshua. Meaning that it is another name for Jesus. For it took Joshua to take the children of Israel over Jordan into the promised land because Moses could not do it because he failed. Not that Moses was weak, but he failed because he represented the law. The law could never take us into the promised land. And Moses did mess up. He did smoke the rock twice instead of speaking to it. And because of that, he was penalized and he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land, but he died on the mountains of Moriah there on Nebo. And God hid his body. I'm not going to go into that nine yards again that we've already went through. 
But I want you to understand that it takes a deliverer. It takes a savior to take us off of this planet and to set us on solid ground in heavenly places. It takes a savior to get us off of this abandoned planet of all in all sanity. How many know this planet's just about been abandoned of all common sense? Just about been abandoned of all sanity. But thank God we have a better world than this one that we're going to because of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Joshua is a picture of the coming high priest. And by the way, he came, his name is Jesus Christ, and today he is our high priest that sits in the heavens, who died once and for all, who makes intercession for you and I. His name is Jesus Christ. And so Zechariah sees into the future by this vision that he has in his sleep. In fact, this is the fourth vision that Zechariah had of the eight visions that he had here through the book of Zechariah through one through chapter eight. In fact, he saw the mounted horses the, the, that's on patrol in chapter one, one through 17. He saw, Zechariah saw the four horns and the uh, four carpenters that come behind those powers that scattered the children of Israel across the world verse 18 through 21, chapter 1. You saw the surveying of the surveyors to measure the city in chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. And here in this fourth vision, Zechariah sees a dirty high priest. This high priest, according to verse 4 of chapter 3, was clothed with filthy garments. And with those filthy garments, he was portraying the iniquity of not only Israel, but the filth and the iniquity of the whole world. By all rights, we are our own caretaker of our life. And that's why we need someone else to take care of us because we're lousy at caretaking ourselves. In fact, we cannot save ourselves. And so Jesus Christ is our high priest that took our sins and took our defilement on the cross of Calvary as our high priest. Now you need to understand when Jesus Christ went to that cross, he did not just go as a lamb for the sin of the world. But when he went to that cross, he went as a high priest, for Jesus was a priest. And when he died, they put him in the tomb, the body of Jesus. And during that time, he spoke as a prophet to the spirits in prison. He arose again from the dead, and he took the blood of himself to heaven, to heaven and there on heaven's altar, On the mercy seat, Jesus Christ presented his blood for the sins of the world as the high priest. See, Jesus is not just the high priest. He's prophet, priest, and king. And he came as a prophet. He came as a priest, and today he is a priest. And soon he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. What a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. He said, well, why does the Old Testament and even New Testament seem so complex at times? Well, they're trying to explain Jesus. And that makes it a little bit harder. Because he goes by by so many virtues and so many majestic powers. And he goes, well, he's God. And you just can't explain God. But I'm glad that God gave his son, Jesus Christ, so that we could look at Jesus and sum it all up in one word. Jesus, the Savior of the world. So Zechariah tells us, I want you to meet Joshua. Now, he introduces us to Joshua in this chapter 3. And then Zechariah introduces us to another person 
by the name of Zerubbabel in chapter 4. We need to understand Joshua and Zerubbabel before we can understand the progression of the book of Zechariah. What if I was to tell you that Joshua, the high priest here in chapter 3, is working along beside Zerubbabel, who is a political figure, in chapter 4, and Joshua and Zerubbabel, along with, with um, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, um, Ezra, Nehemiah, they're working together to try to get God's people together, together. Now, Nehemiah was more about the wall. Ezra, Haggai was more about the city of Jer the temple, rather, in the city of Jerusalem. And we talked about how God said, don't be afraid to trust me. I'll be your wall of fire. We talked about that last Wednesday night. But hear me, because it's real important that you understand Joshua is a type, a picture of Jehovah Savior. It's a picture of Yeshua, the Savior of the world. Only he can take us into the promised land. Only Jesus and him alone. Zerubbabel is a political figure. In fact, he was born in Babylon. If you study Zerubbabel and look at the definition of his word, it means born in Babylon. He was born in captivity. The same with Joshua. Now, it's very clear here that God is going to do something very unique and he's going to merge Zerubbabel with Joshua the high priest to show us one person and that person is our high priest, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's going to merge these two together, the political and the spiritual figure. He's going to merge together. We'll see that later in this book. And that's why you need to understand this in order to understand the book of Zechariah. Now, I'm ready for some good goodies here. Yeah, from good, some goodies. You see, the Bible says that Zechariah saw Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand, resisting him. Now, if I was going to write this, I would write, Satan stood at his left hand. But only one problem is, if I'd have wrote it that way, it would have been wrong. You say, why would it have been wrong? Because Satan was standing at his right hand. I mean, truth is the truth. You can't change it. And basically what he's trying to say is Satan has the best statistic, uh, the best uh, uh, strategy and the best position in order to come against the world. Satan is, it looks like Satan's in a very good position to rain havoc upon the planet and, uh, and upon God's people. I, you know, it's kind of like this. The Lord allowed Satan to stand on the right because he knew he was going to be a failure and flop anyway. God knew the devil was going to fail and flop anyway. But notice it says that Satan was standing in his right hand resisting. This is Joshua, the high priest. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. It is not, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire. Now I want to share some stuff that will make you shout. Make you happy. Amen. If you're sad, you're not going to be sad long. This will make you happy. I mean, this will make you happy, happy, happy. Now, in verse 2, it says that the Lord buked Satan twice. Now, why in the world would it say the Lord rebuked Satan twice? Well, he's talking about not only his first coming, Jesus, but his second coming, so he's rebuking Satan as he comes to the cross of Calvary and dies for the sin of the world. He actually swaps, swaps places with Joshua the high priest. He trades places. Jesus does. And I love this part. The Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuked thee. Well, <laughs> doesn't that seem strange? The Lord rebuked thee. The Lord rebukes, you know, that seems strange. Not if you read it like this. And the Lord said unto Satan, my son rebukes you. Lord, 
King of kings, Lord of lords, my son rebukes you. So you got two lords here. And we know the Lord is Jesus Christ. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. Meaning, my son rebuked thee, O Satan. And even the Lord has chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. In other words, Jehovah rebukes you. The God of Israel rebukes you. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob rebukes you. So he gets it from the Father. Satan gets it from the Father. And Satan gets it from the Son. Double whammy. Right hook. Left hook. Down with Satan. That's basically what he's saying. That has a ring to it. Right hook. Left hook. Down. But understand it says that he chose him Jerusalem, verse 2. And he says, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, John Wesley uses this verse 2 as one of his life verses. John Wesley is a preacher of days gone by, a preacher of Methodism, a great movement of God during the um, great awakening in the time of the um, time of leaving the church of Thyatira and into the church of Sardis. And John Wesley took this and said, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And the reason John Wesley took this as his life verse was because when John Wesley was five years old, he was trapped in a house fire. And the neighbors could not get to him because it was in an upper level in the house. And two men got together and one man stood on the other man's shoulders and got up into the window and drug John Wesley out of the fire. And John Wesley says, that's my verse. I'm a brand plucked out of the fire. Isn't that beautiful? Now, what is a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, we know that God here is speaking about not only Israel, but God's speaking about those that are bound in sin. And so he's referring to Jerusalem being like a, a brand plucked out of the fire. And um, a brand, it's simply this. How many have been in a campfire and where there was just one little old piece of stick burning and it's smoldering and it was on fire, but just one little old stick burning and it was about to burn out, but yet it was still burning, just a blackened, burned piece of stick. That's a brand. Plucked out of the fire. Ugly, charred, mutilated, scarred. And God says, I'll rescue you out of the fire like a brand that's plucked out of the fire. I will take you out of the fire and I will bring you into the glory. I'll bring you out of the fire, the charred, the, 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 the darkened, the, the, the mutilated, the burning. You're just about gone. But God says, I'll rescue you out of the fires of hell. I'll rescue out of hell fire. I'll rescue out of destruction. I'll come at the last minute and I'll take that little brand of fire out of the, a little brand out of the fire and I'll rescue you and give you eternal life. And that's what God is saying concerning Israel. And that's what God is saying concerning you and I. We're never so far gone and we are never so far burned up and we're never so far charred and mutilated and scarred that God can't step in and rescue us out of the fire. <laughs> Woo! Told you to get to shout, get ready to shout, and get happy. So it makes no difference what you've done. It's no difference how bad it's been. And so God shows us this is what he's going to do. How's he going to rescue us out of the fire? Well, he's going to use this introduction of this new person, Joshua. And Joshua is the high priest. And notice Joshua in verse 3, he's clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Pathetic mess. Joshua stands before the angels with filthy garments. And God is saying, that's the way you are. And that's the way Israel is. They stand before me with filthy garments. 
And Satan stands there and rebukes. And Satan stands there and says, you've had it. And Satan stands there and says, you'll never be saved. And Satan stands there rebuking and trying to pull you down. And Satan stands there and says, you're worthless. And you'll never amount to anything. And you'll never make it to heaven. And you'll never be any good to God. Never be any good to anybody. You're worthless. Satan stands there and God says, not so fast, devil. The Lord, my son, rebukes you. My son is going to snatch them out like a brand out of the fire. Woo! Notice it says, verse 4, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. Who are those that stood before him? Well, I believe that's probably the angelic group of people as well as the um, horsemen that were on patrol in chapter 1. And notice what he says. Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Listen to me. God is saying to the devil, I will take their place. I'll become the high priest with filthy garments. I'll take the sin of the world upon me. I'll take the, uh, the sin of this planet upon me. I'll take the filthy garments of humanity. I'll take them. I'll go to the cross. I'll die on the cross, and I'll be like the brand in the fire. I will perish in the death on the cross of Calvary, but I'll get up as the resurrected Son of God, and I will give you a brand new clothing of raiment to wear, delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm going to do this for Israel and for you and I. Verse 4, and he answered and spake and said to those that stood, take away the filthy garments. And he caused the iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. I'm glad I'm all dressed up with somewhere to go. <laughs> Woo! How many glad you all dressed up with somewhere to go? Amen? Church of Laodicea is naked and ain't got nowhere to go. Look at verse 5. And I said, let them set a fair metra upon their head. Now that metra is a turban-like thing that the high priest wore on their head. And on that turban, fair metra, upon his head, clothed with his garments, the angel of the Lord stood by. Now listen, they put the metra or the garment, the, the, the uh, woven covering on his head, the priest would wear that like a turban on top of their head, a metra, but it would say across it, holiness unto the Lord. And so Joshua's filthy garments is stripped and removed, and God gives him a brand new garment, puts on his head a new metra, and it says, holiness unto the Lord. Now we see Jesus Christ, holiness unto the Lord, a king of kings, the Lord of lords, and our high priest. You say, how do you see that? Look at verse 5, the last sentence. And the angel of the Lord stood by. <laughs> That's what Jesus is doing tonight. The angel of the Lord stands by. So why doesn't it say Jesus? Because here he's the angel of the Lord. He is, this is a manifestation of Jesus as the angel of the Lord. And he's on standby. How many know God's on standby for you? You say, well, why is he on standby for me? Because God knows you'll mess up. That's why he's on standby. Amen? Hello? How many ever went to the bull rides at, in the rodeo? Ever went to bull rides? How many ever went to, uh, by the way, football? They'll put an ambulance outside the football field. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to play any sports that they got to have an ambulance just outside the gate. Bull riding, they have an ambulance just outside the gate. That's why, that's why when Dirt rode bulls in his younger life, they had to have an ambulance there to protect him. Now, you know why they have an ambulance? And I don't know whether, I don't know whether Dirt ever rode bulls or not, but I'm sure he's met a lot of people full of bull. But anyway, but the, the, the truth is simply this. 
God is on standby because he knows you're going to get a hold of the wrong bull. Amen? Jesus is on standby. The angel of the Lord stood by. Verse 5. This is talking about Jesus. Now, the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, now that word protested doesn't mean he argued with Joshua. Just means he said, I'm going to give you some orders. I'm going to bark some orders to you. And the, and the angel of the Lord gives Joshua some orders. And these orders are for us too. These orders are for Israel. Thus said the Lord of hosts. There it is. Thus said the Lord of hosts. If thou wilt walk in my ways, and, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk upon these that stand by. Now these that stand by is Satan, the Lord, the angels, and perhaps even the people on patrol in chapter one. Now notice verse eight. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Now who are these men wondered at? Who who are these men? Who are these fellows that are before thee? I think we'll see that in just a minute. For they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, Jesus in Joshua is declared the high priest, the angel of the Lord. Now, here in verse 8, he's declared the servant, the branch. Jesus is called the branch. Anybody ever read scripture where it says, Jesus, thou son of David? You may have heard that talk about Jesus, the son of David. Isaiah chapter um, 4, verse 2, it says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. Speaking of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, Jesse was David's daddy. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Remember, it talks about in Revelation that Jesus Christ is the root of David in Revelation chapter 5. Also, it talks about Jesus being the branch in Jeremiah 23, verse 5, and Jeremiah 33, verse 15. So he's the branch. He's the son of David. He's called the branch. Remember where he says, without me, you can do nothing. Remember Jesus Christ said, I am the true vine, you are the branches. Well, we're the extension of Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is the branch, and we're the extension of Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me. Notice verse 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the gra uh, graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. He's talking about when Jesus returns the second time, he's talking about Israel being redeemed in one day. But notice he talks about a stone. In one day, this stone will redeem the planet. So how's that going to happen? Daniel chapter 2, verse 45. Daniel chapter 2. How many remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and there's this big old statue head of gold and talked about his uh, shoulders of silver and going down the thighs of brass and then his legs of iron, two legs of Rome, then the feet of, of clay and iron mingled together. And, and Daniel was told by the angel, this is the kingdoms of the world. And that Nebuchadnezzar said, I saw a, a stone carved out of a mountain without man's hands. And that stone was carved out of the mountain without man's hands. And it come out of the mountains as a stone. And Nebuchadnezzar says in verse, actually in Daniel 2 verse 45, I'll quote Daniel 2 verse 35. Um, it says, then was the iron, that's Rome, and the clay, that's the revised Roman Empire, the brass, that's the Grecian Empire. The silver, that's the Medes and the Persian Empire. The gold, that is the head of gold, Babylon. And I saw it broken to pieces together 
became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image at the feet became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's the stone he's talking about, Jesus Christ. When he comes, he's going to pulverize the kingdoms of the world. Isn't that good? Now someone says, well, um, what about these seven eyes upon a stone? Now we can answer our question, did the stone have seven eyes? Or was there seven eyes looking at the stone? And then you kind of interpret that two ways if you want to. Was the seven eyes in the stone? You say, well, preacher, that sounds really weird. Well, trust me, Zechariah has dreamed weirder dreams than that. Like a flying scroll. Like an old lady in a basket that was too small. But notice this. It says, eyes, seven eyes were upon him. What, what could possibly be them seven eyes? Well, we can understand that those seven eyes could actually be, remember the red horse in, in Zechariah chapter 1 and the, the white horse and the speckled horse, uh, uh, the horses on patrol, that could be the eyes. But something else I want you to understand, what would be those seven eyes? How many, how many remember the Friend brothers, you know, Daryl Friend and Dwayne Friend? I know Brother, uh, Brother Ward remembers them. They used to preach a sermon, Seven Eyes Upon the Stone. And they preached that sermon all over the country, Seven Eyes Upon the Stone. And they used an illustration that those seven eyes could be, I wrote it down here, the Creator's eyes is on the stone. Jesus is the stone. The angel's eyes are upon the stone, for Jesus is the stone. Abraham's eyes are upon the stone, because Jesus is the stone. The patriarch's eyes are upon the stone, because Jesus is the stone. The prophet's eyes are upon the stone, because Jesus is the stone. The Gentiles' eyes are upon the stone because Jesus is the stone. The church's eyes are upon the stone because Jesus is the stone. There's seven right there, seven eyes upon the stone. Uh, you can preach any sermon you want to out of that. You can just pick the seven eyes because all eyes are on the stone. Hey, listen to me, all eyes are on the stone. And so I think from the prophets till now, all eyes have been on the stone. I believe the scriptures teach that all eyes have been up on the stone. And the ones watching, let me back up a little bit because I want you to, uh, I, I don't want you to feel like I'm leaving something out. In Revelation chapter 5, it talks about Jesus being the root of David, the branch. Um, talked about the seven eyes being upon the stone, which that could be many different eyes. Could it be a stone with seven eyes? It could be, but I'm not, I'm not there. I don't think that's probably the interpretation. But it does talk about people watching the magnificent glory of God. And I want, I, I want to explain something. Before we go into the fourth chapter, I don't have a lot of time left, but before we go into the fourth chapter uh, where Zachariah says, I want to introduce you to Zerubbabel. Now, you've got to understand, Zerubbabel was born. His name means born in Babylon. His name means born in captivity. I know someone else that was born in captivity. His name is Jesus Christ. He was born in the captivity of Rome, an extension of Babylon. Jesus Christ. You say, well, Jesus wasn't the government. But when he came, what was the government in Israel? The priests ran the government. The Sanhedrin was the government of Israel. Now, Rome was the government, but you know what I'm talking about. Israel's government was the Sanhedrin. Rome was actually over them, but the truth is they had their own. And, and the truth is the high priest becomes, and the priest of Israel becomes the government of the Israel. Remember, I'm telling you that Joshua and Zerubbabel becomes one, and that one is Jesus Christ. 
Remember when Jesus Christ came, he came to be our high priest. But when he re returns, he's coming to be king of kings and lord of lords. In fact, he's coming to set up a government. Are you listening to me? He's coming to set up a government. I want you to notice something before we come to a close tonight. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. What does it say about Jesus? Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, For unto you a child is born. That's our Savior. Unto us a son is given. That's the crucif crucified Son of God. Notice a child is born, that's the one to govern, that's the one to rule. The son is given, that's the one to be sacrificed. And the government shall be upon whose shoulders? His. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Remember I told you that Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel will merge to be one, a Messiah. I think it's interesting in the fourth, in the, in the third chapter, uh, Joshua is mentioned five times, and then again in chapter 6, verse 11, glorified as the high priest in his full glory in attire. Zerubbabel is mentioned four times just in the fourth chapter of Zechariah. Zer Zerubbabel is mentioned in verse 6 and 7 and verse 9 and 10, and he's not mentioned thereon in the book of Zechariah. Now, Zerubbabel's job was to govern Israel while they produced and rebuilt the temple. He was the governor. He was a Babylon-born governor. And Joshua's job was to be the high priest of the new temple. Once that's done, Jesus Christ comes as a Joshua, first coming to be the high priest. He'll return as the Zerubbabel, and he will rule all nations with a rod of iron. He will become the government of the world. Now, I said all that so I could thoroughly mix you up as I read verse four, chapter 4, because this is important that you see this. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me, meaning he probably fell back to sleep, as a man that waketh out of his sleep, and said unto me, What do you see? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the to top. This is actually the fifth vision of the golden lampstand and the, and the two olive trees. Verse 3, And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. Now, who is the two olive trees? The two olive trees is Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel. Now, I say that because you're going to think you're a crazy preacher because they mentioned two in Revelation. And I'm going to show you just how crazy I am in just a minute. But notice it says, verse 4, and I answered and spake to the angel and talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And then the angel that talked with me said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, I'm stupid. I don't know. No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. Woo, I love that verse. Not my might, not my power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Listen to me, Jerubbabel, O thou, O great mountain before Jerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone. Therefore, with shouting, the headstone of Jesus, crying, Grace, grace 
unto it. And the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, what seven? Maybe the seven eyes upon the stone. What seven? Maybe the seven eyes of the horses on patrol in chapter one. I don't know. But we know that seven is found in the book of Revelation. And we know that seven is a, is a word for completeness and perfection. Notice it says the seven eyes are, uh, are, are the seven eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. The reason I think it might be the horses, the red horse and the other red horses and the speckled horse and the white horse, because in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8 to 11, it talks about these are the eyes that go to and fro upon the earth. All is peace. Isn't that good? Then answered I, verse 11, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees? The right side of the candlestick upon the left side thereof. And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, I'm still stupid as ever. No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones. Now the anointed ones in Revelation chapter 11 verse 4 these are the two anointed ones, just with a high priest in Zerubbabel. These are the two anointed ones, Moses and Elijah. These are the two anointed ones, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. These are the two anointed ones. And it says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, before I stop, let me point out in verse 12 and 13 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land. Who's Jesus from? He's from the line of the tribe of Judah. And shall choose Jerusalem again. Jesus will choose Jerusalem again. He's from the line of the tribe of Judah. Jesus was not a Levite. He was a Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was a Gentile priest. Hello. Be silent, O flesh, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Jesus raised up out of his holy habitation. Now let me bring this to a close because we're running out of time. I know your mind can take it in, but your, your, your sitter can't take it all in. But your sitter will fall asleep on you if you ain't careful. But anyway... I just hate it when my sitter falls asleep. Anybody have that happen? You never know what the pastor's going to say, but that's true. Now notice, remember I said that you had to understand that Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the governing party, government, is a, will merge together as one Messiah, and that Messiah is the Lord in Jesus Christ. He comes as the Lamb of God, he is the high priest for the sins of the world. He continues at the high priest in the hands of God, but he returns as a Zerubbabel. He returns as the governor, the ruler, the king of kings over all the earth. That's starting to make sense to you now, isn't it? Now you say, well, how could you bring Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest and, and, and you could bring these two olive trees together in Revelation. Let me show it to you real quick because, and then we'll be done. Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. I'm going to turn there. We'll make sure I get it right. Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. Now remember, I just read you in chapter 4 of Zechariah that they were the two olive trees. Now look at chapter 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks, standing before the God of the earth. 
So how can you get Moses and Elijah? Why isn't it Enoch and Elijah? Well, first of all, Zerubbabel was the governing political party. He was the governor. Joshua the high priest was the spiritual guidance of the house. When Jesus returned to the earth, well, not return, but when he came to the earth as the Son of God in the first coming, he found Israel controlled by the political party, the Sanhedrin. Rome was over it, but you know what I'm saying. And then they, needed, they had a high priest. The high priest was pretty much running the show when Rome didn't butt in the high priest. So they, the two had merged together. Well, one day... The Zerubbabel and Joshua will merge together in one person. His name is Jesus Christ. Now, the reason I believe the two witnesses is Moses and Elijah is simply this. Joshua, the high priest, was the spiritual leader. Zerubbabel was the governor or the political leader. Hear me. Jesus Christ is going to be upon his government show you know, the worlds will be upon him. His government will be no end. He is the master. He's the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor. He's, uh, upon his shoulders shall be the government of the world. So when Jesus returns, the two's going to merge. The high priest and the governor, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, going to merge. And there'll be one priest. His name is Jesus Christ. And there'll be one law. And it is the law of God. There'll be one King of kings, one king, one law, one priest, one Lord, one maker of heaven and earth, and his name is Jesus Christ. All going to merge together. Now, I have many reasons why I believe Moses is the other one, and let me put it like this. Joshua, the high priest, was the priest. Zerubbabel was the governor or the leader of political party. They merged together. They will merge together. And they did merge together before Jesus came the first coming. They will be merged together when Jesus returns in the second coming. After the rapture, when he returns the earth, all of Israel will be saved. They'll be merged together. Jesus will show up not only as King of kings and Lord of lords, but he'll be the high priest, the King of kings, everything all wrapped up in one. But there's two people that's going to spur this on and ignite this as Jesus Christ returns. And they're called the two witnesses. The two witnesses, you say, well, why can't one of them be Enoch? Because Enoch was a prophet, Elijah was a prophet. They both were prophets. We have to have a political leader. We have to have someone that is leading by rule. His name is Moses. Now, Moses was a prophet, yes, but he was more than a prophet. He was one that governed Israel by law, by ordinances. Are you learning? I hope you're learning. And, and, and I hope I'm not confusing you, but it's really powerful. Notice it says in verse 4, or ver, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 4, these are the two olive trees, two candlesticks standing before the God of all the earth. They can't be hurt. Proceeds out of the fire, proceeds out of their mouth. I'm going to stop there because there's two people that fire came out of their mouth, and one was Moses and the other was Elijah. And, and, you know, the waters and the power over the plagues, one was Moses and one was Elijah. So we're not going any further than that. And you say, well, I still think it's Enoch and, and, uh, and, and Elijah. Think what you want to think. Uh, you, you know, you're free to believe what you want to believe. You can walk out of here and you're still my friend. You're wrong, but you're still my friend. You say, well, doesn't, doesn't it say it's appointed... Uh, unto all men that they die and then the judgment. That's not what it says. Where is it in Hebrews 9, 27, something like that? It says it's appointed unto men once to die. It doesn't say it's appointed unto all men once to die and after this judgment. It says it's appointed unto men, the race. And there's a whole church not going to die. If the Lord shows up tonight, I refuse to die. If the Lord shows up and the trumpet sounds and he calls us home I, this body refuses to die I'm going to change and get up there as quick as possible in a changed glorified body amen 
I hope you understood this tonight. I, I hope it helped you get an understanding. And, and don't let, let me say something real quick as I give a, a, a close in the sermon. Don't be so caught up in the details of Zechariah. Get caught up in the big picture. The details will drive you nuts. And the details will cause you to misinterpret things. Look at the big picture. And I tried to give you tonight the big picture. So I introduced to you Joshua, the high priest. I introduced to you the governor, Zerubbabel, the governor who worked together to get the church or the temple of God rebuilt. All ties in with Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, all hooks in together. Aren't you guys, I don't know how anybody could say you don't need the Old Testament. I just don't understand that. I, I need the Old Testament. That's where breathing started. Hello? That's where breathing started. I, don't, I need the Old Testament. It started, started with breathing. That's where eating started. There's nothing wrong with the Old Testament. You need to understand the Old Testament connects with the New Testament. And the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I realize the New Testament is built on better promises and greater things. But we need to understand that the Old Testament, if it were not for the Old Testament, we would never understand the New Testament. And if it wasn't for the Old Testament, we'd never have a full understanding of who Jesus Christ is. Isn't that beautiful? So you may be here tonight feeling like one of them little sticks that's about to burn up. A brand plucked out of the fire. And you may be charred and wounded and just about to smolder away. But the Lord God Almighty says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. He's saying, my son rebukes you. He's coming to the fire and he's going to pull that brand out of the fire because he's coming to be your priest. And he's going to take on the dirty, filthy garments that Joshua had. And there happen to be mine and yours. And he's going to take them filthy garments upon the cross of Calvary. And when he arises from the grave, he's going to be your everlasting high priest that liveth forever. And he'll have that holiness to the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? I'm glad you came tonight. Praise the Lord. Now, we'll, we'll be in the fifth chapter next Wednesday night. Lord willing, church don't rise. And I'm not going to tell you we're, we're going to take care of chapter 6 or 7. I'm just going to say 5 for now. We'll see where we're at. You didn't think I'd get through 3 and 4 tonight, did you? Well, I did, but I stretched the time a little bit. But I got it. Amen. I'm sure glad I got a church that's not worried about time. They want to learn. They want to grow. Amen. I get too many amens, I'll preach longer. So just don't stretch your luck with me. Don't stretch your luck. Start acting like you like it. I might keep you here much longer. Just don't stretch it. Don't deceive me. <laughs> Josh, come and bring us on. If you feel like that little brand plucked out of the fire, just remember God is a God who heals, forgives, washes, and cleans. He gives you a brand new garment that's no longer soiled. He gives you a new life a new blessing. Amen. Now you see how Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel merges together to be one? Through the government and through the high priest's salvation. For Jesus becomes one in all of our doings, both spiritually, physically, and nationally. Jesus becomes the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Stand with me. Amen. Amen.